So yeah, let's start by reviewing yesterday. Uh, first, there's a correction um, in the in the in the lecture notes you you can access on the web page. There's a typo on the last digit of this archive number that lets you uh, uh, wrong paper. Uh, not, 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 not the paper is wrong. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> uh, uh, it's, it, it was not a paper that I intended. Uh, you can also look at uh, my notes on the archive um, that uh, that basically contains all the idea that I described uh, yesterday with the uh, with a, a little bit more technical detail. Uh, um, so the today's topic is the homology and the least relation to error correcting codes. And the later half, I will focus on the uh, entanglement of the RNG transformation, which, is, which can be think of it as a, some encoding map into your code. Um, uh, yeah, we'll get to that. And in the meantime, we will be basically delivering the main idea why homology is a topological invariant. So you may find it amusing that it's a completely a pure math question is now proved along the lines of coding theory. Uh, so, but let's, before we begin, let's just briefly review what we have done yesterday. Uh, we, do, it, we, did, we derived a, a quantum singleton bound uh, for the case of the uh, Pauli stabilizer code, the code length, number of, number of physical qubits, number of encoded qubits, and the code distance are related by this inequality. The main idea was for this proof was that uh, the major step was to show that the number of encoded qubits is less than the entropy of the region uh, that is a complement of the two uh, individually correctable regions. Um, and the, the, the key uh, concept or equation that you, I encourage you to remember is the code projector is, a, is a, uh, uh, the projector onto the, uh, the, the, the space where G assumes identity where the, where the sum ranges over all elements of S, so it is indeed a projector. And the correctable region means that what, whatever operator you give me, if I sandwich by the code space projector, um, then it becomes a scalar multiplication. Operationally, whatever you want to do on the code space by acting on a correctable region, all you can do is just a scalar multiplication. So operationally, it does nothing. Um, and I omitted, for the time's sake, uh, one important bound that I wanted to discuss. Uh, the proof is very simple, so I just wrote it here, and let me go through the argument. The goal is to prove that in a geometrical local code on the Euclidean space of dimension capital D, the codes, codes, uh, code distance can be only as large as the co-dimension one object volume. So in case of two dimension, it can only be linear dimension. In three dimensions, it can be a surface area that always co-dimension one. The argument is entirely one dimension. Uh, it applies to arbitrary dimension because we can always slice a Euclidean capital D dimensional uh, cube into slices of uh, L to the D minus one uh, worth of slice, and uh, each slice is laid down like this in a, in a, in a fashion. The inverse thickness is order the locality of the uh, stabilizer generator. So it's a constant number, some, some fixed number. And if this D is greater than that number, well, in particular, if each interval individually was correctable on its own, then <coughs> because of the locality, the, their union must be correctable as well. Uh, whatever logical operator you give me that are supported on the union, I can test the commutativity with the stabilizer group individually, and that should also be true. So individually, that must be trivial. The combination must be trivial as well. So the union becomes uh, correctable. The other union must be also correctable, but there's nothing else beyond that. So applying this inequality, that number of encoded qubits must be, at most, the entropy of the complement of the two individually correctable region, we got nothing, so the con conclusion must be the k is zero, encoding no, no logical qubit. So whenever you have a non-logical, non-trivial uh, error correcting code, uh, your very assumption, the very beginning assumption must be violated, which is that the code distance at, at one of the, at least one of the interval is not uh, correctable. No, it does not assume that. Uh, it, it, well, so 
Okay, forget about the capital D dimension, just focus on the one dimension where there are only some, some finitely many uh, qubits per per this interval. If I assume that the, uh, uh, each reach, well, the only assumption I am, I'm, I'm using is that any interval that's, whose length is larger than O of R, then it's correctable. Conclusion is that no, there's no encoded qubit. Okay, let's, uh, let's uh, look at the homology then. Um, so I assume no knowledge about the homology. Uh, and I, uh, while preparing this, I realized the historical amazing coincidence. The beginning of the 20th century was the era of invention of quantum mechanics. Homology has a similar feature in the following sense. So let me start with the chain complex. Um, it's called complex, so it might look complicated, but not. Uh, it's just a series of linear spaces indexed by the integer. There may be uh, some infinitely many linear spaces you want to consider. Oh yeah, some, some ground field is fixed. It doesn't have to be field, but for the sake of simplicity, let's assume field. Um, and there's a, this is linear space, and by arrow, I mean some linear map. Uh, historically, it is denoted by this boundary symbol because it's called boundary map. And, uh, and there are a chain of maps. Okay. And it's called chain complex if the composition of the two consecutive maps is equal to zero. So useful picture is that you think of the linear space as a blob, and then, so each uh, C comes with a blob, and the linear map will map this into some subspace, like this. So the image is a, a subspace of the next linear space. And the composition being zero means that if I do it twice, then it should map to zero. Uh, the actual map from here to here will be mapped along like this. So you have this like a, like a telescope uh, looking figure. And that's the, that's the pictorial understanding of this. Algebraic homology of the chain complex is defined by, uh, I should write it here, because um, it should be a lot, uh, no. Mm. So I define a quotient group So this is called a homo homology group defined for each index j. So at this position, what you look at is you look at the kernel of this map. So it will be some, some subspace that looks like this. And by assumption, the image of the previous map will land on inside it somewhere here. Because you know, it, it, I, if I do go, go twice, then I should go here. So my pre-image must be oh, well, my my image must be here, and I and I consider the quotient, which means I consider only this piece. That's called the homology. This is a purely algebraic definition. There's no topology or anything. Um, yeah. So it's called complex because it, it's got with a lot of data. That's, I think that's why it's called complex, but. This is, this is the homology. Um, and it's got invented in a topological context. How? And there, there comes the correspondence with the quantum mechanics. Is, um, let's imagine a circle. Um, I can draw a circle with a two points with a two arcs. And the, one arc is like a interval. And I la label it by V1 and V2. And let this edge be E1 and E2. No problem with that. I just named it. And then I consider, this is, um, this is the amazing part to me. I consider the linear span of V1 and V2. And, and call it to be C0. And 
another, another span. E1 and E2. So E1 and E2 are just labels. Yes. J minus one. Oh, oh, oh yeah, J plus one. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, the previous map. I'm sorry. Yeah, the one, one, one that comes before. Yeah. So out of nowhere, I just constructed a two-dimensional linear space whose basis is given by the vertices. Why would I construct linear combination of vertices? Well, in quantum mechanics, you every, every day you do this. You consider superposition of you know, um, mass being here and versus mass being there, and you take a superposition, you add them. What does it mean, even mean to add them? You just declare to take a linear combination. Here I do the same thing. Uh, there's no operation naturally defined to add two vertices together or multiply by a scalar, but I just declare that it is done. And that's the <laughs> amusing connection I find between quantum mechanics and homology. Um, and then I construct a linear map between the two, going from the higher dimension to lower dimension. How? By taking the boundary of this edge. So in matrix, So my, my, uh, my space comes with the preferred basis because they are labeled by the cells themselves. So E1 here have a boundary points, boundary points V1 and V2. So um, to not be distracted, all, let all the coefficients be Z2. We, we don't worry about the sign. So E1's, uh, E1 will be mapped onto this one plus one. Uh, you, you have V1 plus V2. And E2 has the same boundary points, so my matrix will be like that. So and now this chain complex, two spaces, one map, is a chain complex because I can always add zero maps at the end and at the front. So one linear map is trivially a chain complex. And what's the homology? At the zero dimension, kernel of this map, which is everything, modulo the image from the, the previous map. The rank of this matrix over the binary field is one, so I will have a, a one-dimensional homology here. What about this? The kernel of this map will be the domain rank, I'm sorry, the, the dimension of the domain minus the rank of this map, which is also one, modulo zero, because there's nothing comes from the higher dimension. So homology at zero dimension is also one dimensional. And homology at the, at the dimension one is also one dimensional. That's it. We can do this exercise once again with a triangle say this f, v1, v2, v3, v1, e2, e3. And how can I construct the map? So the zero dimensional map will be spanned by v1, v2, v3. One dimensional cells are, there are three of them, e1, e2, e3. At dimension two, how many cells do I have? Just one, F, so F. So I construct a, a, a linear map according to our well, quote-unquote intuition by taking the boundary. What's the boundary of F? It consists of three edges. So I take the linear combination of the three cells together. How about here? It's got a three by three matrix. E1 is mapped to V1, V2, so one, one, like that. E2, V1, V3, E3 goes to V2 and V3. And, right, so the, the map is going along that direction. And it, it's, you, it's, you know, well, you can do calculation over your head that if I multiply this matrix to that, that the result is zero. 
So if I add join zero maps here and there, then the overall thing is a chain complex and you can compute the homology and so on. That's the homology, okay? Now, you may wonder, uh, oh, here's a, another, uh, like a, a little bit abstract point. So I drew figures using points, lines, and faces, and uh, formally they call zero cell, one cell, and two cell, depending on the dimensionality. So there is a, a collection of those cells, which is called CW complex. And then we constructed a chain complex consists of linear space, each spent by the cells themselves. And then we take the homology groups, one at each dimension. Now, given a, uh, some topological space, whatever you, 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 you want to study, uh, the, 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 the very prescription for decomposing into cells is up to you. It's not a priori given. I could have introduced a third cell, a uh, third point, for example, uh, introduce, increase the number of vertices to, seven, to three instead of two, and the number of edges is now become three instead of two. So this has no uh, a priori canonical thing. Uh, it's, but associated topological spaces are something meaningful I want to study. This map is canonical in the sense that if you have a cell structure, then it's a, there's a well-defined prescription. There's only one thing you can do. Here to here is completely algebraic. You can let the computer do. Amazing thing is that if you compose all these uh, transformations or viewpoint difference, here to here is well-defined. A highly non-trivial statement. There are many arbitrariness going on here but the initial to final is well-defined. And let's understand. I'm not going to prove in a rigorous fashion. Let's understand how it is done using some of the coding theory. Yes. Perhaps you explain the uh, visual visualization of eight J's on this diagram. Yeah. Yeah. yeah could you explain? Oh, this is just a picture. Um, uh, <laughs> I mean, so it is a it is a quotient group. So you know, literal elements here does not. You know, it's well, literal. Uh, the the elements in 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 this case is always equivalence class modulo this. So there may be a two points in this space that are identified because of this uh, the subspace, the, the image. Um, so in that sense, it's not appropriate to draw a, a diagram for this quotient. But uh, yeah, it's just a picture. <laughs> Oh, oh, well, so, okay, if, you, if this equation is confusing, don't think about the equation. Just think about this map, chain of maps. The rule is, if you go twice, it's zero. That's it. So let's, let's not now, now let the, the, this uh, pure math stuff aside, and then let's come back to error correction. Uh, you have, may have word syndrome, errors, and stabilizers. Um, abstractly, you consider, well, okay, for the sake of con concreteness and uh, easy uh, visualization, let me cons all, all, always consider CSS, where the stabilizer group is decomposed into a purely Z part and purely X part. So you only have to consider either purely X logical operator, I'm sorry, both purely X logical operator and purely Z logical operator. But again, for the uh, sake of simplicity, I only consider uh, 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 Z errors and Z logical operators only. So 
in diagram, you, you have a poly group. And if you are designing some code, and this poly group now, in, the, in, in, our, in my simplification, consists of some, some, sometimes the product of Zs and Is. That's it. And if your error correcting code is going to detect some of the errors, then what you, uh, uh, in, in, a, in a piece of paper, what you do is, given an error, you find a, uh, the, the set of all X stabilizers that are anti-committed with the given error. So that becomes, you know, some, yeah, this is, as I said, this is a space of X stabilizers. Well, maybe it's easier to think of X checks because you are check whether there is an error or not by measuring the X stabilizer. And then, on the other hand, there's a, some Z stabilizers. They are Pauli operators. So if you give me a label of a Z stabilizer, I realize as a Pauli operator here, if you give me two labels of a stabilizer generator, I multiply them together and write down a Pauli operator corresponding to the product. And then, by definition of stabilizer, they commute with the X stabilizers, X checks. So anything that comes from picking a Z stabilizer label, realized as a Pauli, if I check against the X, the X checks, it will result in zero. So I have a two linear maps that compose into zero. So that fits into the, the algebraic definition of homology there. I constructed a part of a chain complex. Uh, three linear spaces, two linear maps. Uh, it is left to, as an exercise, to confirm that these are linear maps over uh, Z2. But that should be easy. Z poly group. Okay, let's instantiate this on a torus. And, and there comes the toric code. Um, I draw square lattice because that's the easiest to draw. But it doesn't have to be a square lattice. And then I, I first consider the checks. Well, by definition, checks are associated with each vertex. And given the vertex, I write down a tensor product of four uh, poly x. Now, oh, yeah, the qubits are laid out on, on the edges. What are, I'm defining. I'm defining a code. Yes. Uh, okay, why don't we do that with an example? Um, so yeah, the definition of the, of the toric code is that you give me a, uh, uh, a graph on the, that can be drawn on a plane, and I assign a one X type stabilizer that is a tensor product of X around a vertex on, on this form. One mnemonic to keep in mind is that the vertex, you know, there's a crossing and the letter X has a crossing, so. <laughs> and uh, if you have a plaquette, then there is a product of Z's around that plaquette, everywhere. Okay, that's my definition of the my stabilizer group. So let's examine that map. So I, I, I kept saying labels. What I mean by label in this context is that I consider the plaquettes. Yeah, you, you, you tell me, oh, I chose this plaquette and that plaquette. Then my job, the job of this, this map is to write down the corresponding stabilizer associated with those plaquettes. C, C. Again, you give me some set of plaquettes. So in the uh, in the formal language, you give me a linear combination of plaquettes. 
which doesn't make sense intuitively, by the way. It's a very innovative idea. Um, then I write down the, the job of this, the first map here is to write down the product of policies around that plugin. If there's a, if you give me a near, nearby plugin, then the, the overlapping Z's will cancel off. And this association is Z, Z2 linear. And the second map, okay, let's forget about the stabilizer for a moment. The second map is that if you give me a poly operator anywhere, oh, yeah, uh, right. Another way of saying it is, if you give me a linear combination of finitely many edges, then I can write down a corresponding Z poly operator, and I test the commutation relation with the vertex stabilizers that are X type. So for this given Z, there are two violations here and here that are anti-commuting with the given uh, uh, poly error. So Z from Z to these two blue dots is, my, is the action of my second map. Super clear? Now let's compose the two maps. You give me a plaquette, and my first map turns that into a product of Z's, and my second map tells me where to put the blue dots when it's where it is anti-commuting with the Z. There's nowhere, and that's by design. I declare that there are a stabilizer group, which means they are commuting, so whatever plaquette you give me, if I realize that the poly operator, then I check, then I test the uh, uh, commutation relation against the X stabilizer, it must vanish. Composition of two maps is zero. Now let's, com let, let's compare that with the, with the homology here. So your drawing is a, is a decomposition of your two plane, two dimensional plane into two dimensional cells, one dimensional cell and vertices, the zero dimensional cell. My Z stabilizer is precisely the boundary of a given two cell that matches the conventional definition of the homology from two, dimension two to dimension one. And the commutation relation turns out that uh, given edge, the commutation, anti-commutation occurs exactly at the end points of that. So that's my uh, boundary map at dimension one, two down to dimension zero. So my prescription from Z stabilizer to Z poly to X checks is nothing but the chain complex that arises from the cellulation of my two plane, and I interpret it as a two cell, one cell, and zero cell. That's exactly the same. Yes. And then they can put each other? Yes. Yeah. Even in the you know, usual homology, the boundary of a plaquette is a loop. The boundary points of, of any segments are can canceling each other. It's, it's the same, same thing. Word by word, same thing. Okay, so let's, now, now that we have uh, some understanding of, uh, of, of the error patterns and the check operators in terms of a geometrical uh, 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 setting, let's show that this has large co-distance. So you put the periodic boundary condition to make it concrete, although I don't really need that. Let's suppose, let's show that, say, this large region is correctable. How do you show that? I didn't, I didn't tell you how many qubits there are. I just showed one geometric uh, covering of that region. I want to show that it's correctable. How do you do that? Well, let's apply this condition. Or equivalently, that uh, uh, whatever operator you give me, there's no, it's, it's not gonna be a non-trivial non logical operator. It, it is a multiple of a stabilizer. Let's focus on Z again. So whatever Z operator you give me here, in order, to, in order for it to be a chance to be a logical operator, it should commute with every X check. In terms of homology, that means 
the Z operator interpreted as a linear combination of my one cells should not have any boundary. So in other words, it is a loop, some, some collection of loops, like here. Now, you have a loop on a two-dimensional plane. It will enclose some number of plockets, but the product of Z-stabilizer of that plocket is precisely the boundary. So I have just shown that the Z poly operator supported on this ball-like region is nothing, if it is commuting with this X checks, is nothing but the product of the Z stabilizers. So it, the, the, this entire ball is correctable. Okay, now if you are designing a code, well, we have checked the, we, we got the stabilizer definition. We, we know that ball-like region is always correctable. And how large can you choose a ball-like region on a, on, under the period of boundary condition? Yes. I'm, I'm only doing for the uh, uh, Z, I'm only doing against the X stabilizer and Z errors. So just to look for the Z logical operator, but you can do the same thing uh, for the X by taking the dual lattice. But I'm not going to do that. Um, so as long as this blob has a linear dimension smaller than the, the period boundary condition, then you're good. So the code distance must be at least the code the linear system size. And that matches, the, in terms of scaling, the bravi terhal bound. So by tessellating torus, we have matched in dimension two. But the question remains, when you're analyzing an error correcting code, you, you, you need to figure out how many logical qubits there are. Okay, let's figure out how many Z logical operators that are non-trivial. <laughs> um, we, we know the formula. Uh, it is going to be the, the commutant of the X stabilizer modulo Z stabilizer. But the commutant is nothing but the zero, the kernel of the second map. Z stabilizer is nothing but the image of the first map. So we are essentially computing the homology, the algebraic definition of homology. Okay, so here we have a precise interpretation of our code in terms of the homology, the topological homology. All we have to do is to compute the homology of torus, two-dimensional torus. It is a uh, well-known easy problem, but let me not quote that result, and let's get to how, how we can show that using uh, whatever tool we have at, at now. So the goal is Calculate this. Mm. Let me not answer this because that's going to be the. Yeah, let's do it in, in five minutes. But let's let me just talk about the higher dimensional generalization first. So, what would you do in the higher dimensional setting? Um, the lesson from looking at that diagram is that if I have a chain complex, then I maybe interpret the subspaces of the chain complex in terms of these elements that I'm done, that I'm defining one error correcting code. And indeed, in high dimensions, for example, for concreteness, consider the simple cubic lattice, like that. And I throw in, and I declare that my qubits are associated with the one cells, the edges, then I have to assign, according to that, uh, I am motivated to define that, that my X stabilizers are associated with the vertex, catching any endpoints of this edge against the Z uh, errors. And that's, so that leads me to define X type stabilizer of weight six for each vertex on this hypercubic lattice. And I want to define the Z stabilizer to be associated with uh, each plocket of weight four stabilizer for each plocket. So Zs are at the two, uh, two cells, qubits are at the one cell, and the X stabilizer are at the zero cells. So this prescription generalized to arbitrary higher dimensions Starting at dimension four, 
something interesting happened. So in, in, if, you're, if you are uh, uh, cellulating a force space, uh, we get five different kinds of cells. Zero, one, two, three, four. It's always d plus one. And we got uh, the boundary maps that forms a, uh, uh, that gives a chain complex when we do the boundary assignment properly. And I want to interpret this chain complex as a code. I could do here, that's the old prescription, putting all the qubits at the one cell, zero cells are for x, two cells are at the z. But I could also do at dimension two, declaring that my two cells are my qubits. My boundary of any three cell is going to be the z stabilizer. For each one cell, I design uh, x stabilizer such that it captures the boundary of a given two cell. That's going to be my x stabilizer. So in literature, this choice is called the, the Fourier toric code. Uh, to be more specific, some people put it 2 comma 2 toric code. But yeah. And this would be like 1 comma 2 toric code, or simply just a three-dimensional toric code. Well, in, in dimension three, you, don't, you, you only don't have this, but you get, get up to C3, and you may wonder, oh, I, I, could choose, I could construct my code here or here, but it turns out, the way, it turns out that you can actually uh, take a dual lattice and they are kind of the same thing. Not exactly the same, but they are kind of the same thing. Okay, that's the higher dimensional torque. Yes. So instead of going in, if you go from 0 to 1 to 2, rather than like taking the x one dimension below and the z one dimension above, is, is that, uh, how does that fit into this like, general recipe? Ah, uh, more general recipe is the following. Um, so, uh, well, forget about the poly operators and stuff, just uh, focus on the topology here. So I have a cell cell structure, and the axes are at the co, well, yeah, co boundary of a, of a point. The, the collection of one cells whose boundary includes that given point. In terms of linear maps, that's precisely the transpose of the boundary map you defined from dimension one to down, down dimension zero. So if you take a transpose of that, of that map and in, in, interpret that is, that is defined in my x stabilizer, then that description, taking transpose and insisting on the x stabilizer, applies here. Uh, ah, uh, so <laughs> if I tell you just one, then you wouldn't know how, how many dimensions that I am in. But if I, t if I tell you one comma two, then you can add them out to figure out the ambient dimension three. And one means that uh, my qubits are at the one cells. In between the x and z. Like yes. Yeah. So yeah. Right. So the, the first coordinate just specifies the, the dimensionality of the cell where the qubits lie. Yeah. No. They're on the edges. So yeah, right, so I, I only gave you definition, uh, and I gave you some recipe to construct any code on a tessellated manifold from the topological data, well, the, 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 yeah, the triangulation data, uh, and the choice of your, of your dimension. Now I want to compute the homology, um, and this is a, um, right, so 
But well, if if I if I give you a, like a five by five grid, then you could write some some code to calculate the linear dimension. No big deal. But mathematics always involves some infinity. So in this case, I want to consider the all possible families of tessellation of my two torus, and I want to answer for the k value for for that entire family. How can I do that? Um, so the my logic here is that I want to reduce. I'm going to reduce the calculation to a finite calculation. The infinitely many possibility comes down to finitely many you know, some possibility, and you, do, you can just do it. So the, the, the piece I'm going to explain is the reduction from that infinite family becomes a finite calculation. Uh, and for that purpose, I'm going to discuss the entanglement RG. Um, right. uh, mm. And to do that, uh, uh, let me briefly remind you with the uh, measurement dynamics versus unitary. It's a bit of a dis dis discourse, but I think it's interesting approach, so let me explain that. So given a stabilizer group generated by the rows of my, uh, well, I, I, I just, well, imagine that I have written my generators in a Pauli string form in a one, one in each row. No, no, no problem. So, in this, in this case, my star, the, the operator associated with the one vertex, will occupy one row, and the next vertex will occupy the next row, and, and so on. So, I just imagine that I have written down that. And then, let's consider I measure a Pauli operator P on top of this stabilizer code state. And let's suppose. Further, to make the story more interesting, P is not logical operator. So not logical means that it, 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 it does not commute with the sum stabilizer. So if I write down my P in some Pauli string form, then you should be able to figure out, oh, this row is anti-commuting with that. That row is anti-commuting with that, and so on. And those those uh, rows are not commuting with my p. So, yeah, it's some, some completely general situation. No locality here. Then I apply the Gauss elimination to reduce the number of generators that are anti commuting with p. How, how far can I go? One. Because I can multiply this row to that to cancel off the any anti commutation sign. So it becomes a commuting row. And whatever there are more anti-commuting row, I can always multiply this to that. There's no locality, just the algebra. So I I'm end up uh, in a situation where all generators are commuting, but one, named Q, is anti-commuting with P. I measure P. What happens? Um, to understand that situation, just imagine the simplest possible. Uh, Q was, say, single Q B Z, and I'm measuring X. So my zero state is stabilized by that Z. If I measure X, what happens? It just forgets the, the underlying state and initializes a state into either plus or minus state, depending on the measurement outcome. That's all. The same thing happens in, the, in this scenario. Um, so the measuring P will kick out this Q, and P itself will creep in. But now the, the, the sign in front of the uh, P as a stabilizer will depend on the measurement outcome. But the measurement outcome is always 50-50 random. Okay? So the measurement dynamics, let's summarize. Uh, given a stabilizer code, if I give you an operator that is not logical, and if I measure that on the on, on top of the code space, then we can find we can reorder or rearrange uh, the my generators in such a way that everything else, everything but one is preserved, and that one is kicked out. P comes in with a sign random. Clear? Now that's the measurement dynamics part, but we can realize that measurement dynamics. Uh, post-selected measurement dynamics using unitary. Consider this P 
plus q, not p times q. What, what is this? This is, well, yeah, this is an operator. This is a self uh, permission operator. And u square is going to be easy. They are 1 because they are qubit poly operators. They always square to, square to 1. What is this? 0. So u is unitary. Um, what about the post-measurement state? Let's consider this expression. If you do calculation right, I didn't give an exercise. I would do that, but uh, writing slows me down, so let me not do it. You can show that this is equal to u times psi. Yeah. And it's, my calculation is independent of the, the logical state of my code, because whatever logical operator you, you, you well, uh, whatever, the logical operators are preserved under this dynamics because I can always multiply my anti commuting stabilizer to that logical operator and let them preserved. So you don't have to worry about whether the S is full rank or not. So my unitary somehow magically realized and transformed my underlying state to the state as if it were P was uh, measured. But the difference is that now I realize that in using unitary. Q is the unique element of S that had and uh, yeah, unique generator of S that is anti committing with P. That's exercise. So if, if, uh, if measurement outcome of P was minus one, then you would have a minus Q here, and I let you figure out what happens afterwards. Sorry? Yes, the stabilizer code is changing. Um, yeah. Now let's mean, let me you know just bootstrap that simple, purely algebraic calculation into this local setting. How can I do? Well, so the goal is to make the cells bigger. You know when I when, when I say. Uh, infinite families of the tessellation of my two surface. I, I was imagining that the T2, the topological space is fixed, but my, my cell relation is refined and ever refined, so it's very fine. That's, that's, that, that makes the infinity. I want to get rid of all the fine-grained triangles or pockets or whatever and become very big, some constant, and then in the end, I, want, I wish to be remained with uh, some constant number of cells. And that's what I mean by reducing the calculation into a finite thing. So abstractly, there is a code space on an n qubit uh, uh, you know, Hilbert space, right? And then I want to transform it, this code space into something else, but some remaining piece that I very well understand. By, by very well, I mean the, the completely disentangled qubits that I can safely forget about. Let's do it on the, on, the, on, on the circle, using repetition code. Um, so I'm, I'm going to follow the same, prescri same prescription as we had, the, had here, but without this, this piece. Only x uh, checks with the z errors. So the vertices are here, qubits are here on the one cells. And my, and, and my x stabilizer is associated with the vertex acting on two nearby edges, okay? That's the same prescription. The co-boundary of a vertex is uh, two edges, so I assign x stabilizer there. It's a repetition code. <coughs> now, imagine I, uh, yeah, maybe. Imagine I measure out z here, yes. Qubits are on the edges. Well, the ticks are remarked because I wanted to you know, signify where the vertices are. 
And the stabilizer generator is uh, one per vertex given by the x times x. Okay? And imagine I, I just measure z, a single qubit poly, just there. So my, uh, my stabilizer generator was, had a list that looked like this. And if I measure, if I bring a z here, then two are anti-commuting. So according to the previous prescription, I'm gonna choose this one to be my unique one and cancel off any anti-commutation in the remainder. So I multiply this to that, that turns this into this, and everything else is now commuting, so I'm fine. So I, I, I singled out one of my uh, uh, stabilizer generator and if I measure z, then the post-measurement state will have this qubit on the eigenstate of z, which is completely disentangled. It's a zero state. So I managed to understand the code better, well, better because I know at least one qubit is in the product state that is a completely disentangled. But I could realize this transformation that singles out the one disentangled qubit using your unitary. So what I have done is I apply a unitary formed by these two poly matrix operators using that formula. I apply it, then one qubit is singled out. So without worrying about what Clifford operator I, I should apply to disentangle one qubit, you just measure, keep measure. Now, okay, now I can measure this. And that the remainder is again a, a repetition code on a, a slightly coarser, one, one, one less qubit. So I measure here and there until I am left with uh, some, say, three qubits. And then you calculate. Yeah. Yes. So, and that one corresponds to z or minus z. Yes. So, isn't it always like zero? No. The probability you will have a zero, a plus one outcome is 50%, exactly. But I don't really care. I mean, the purpose of talking about measurement is, is easier to think about because my, my qubit is going to be certainly disentangled from the rest. That's all, that's all my purpose. And the argument. Uh, uh, behind why I'm doing that is I want a unitary transformation from the old code space into new code space because I don't want to lose anything. And I pointed out that whenever my measurement is anti-commuting with something, my measurement is, can be replaced by some unitary. Although it may, it may depend on the measurement outcome, but I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I'm fine because the, the measurement outcome only affects this disentangled qubit which I'm going to throw away. So using the similar strategy, uh, you can do, you can map the original Tori code on the, on the white lattice into another Tori code on the red lattice by measuring out C here, C here, C here, and C there. Oh, well, the fourth Z is unnecessary because because there was a stabilizer that goes around here. So after you measure the three, the fourth one is all anyway fixed. And uh, it is a, li a little bit exercise that you have to make sure that if I measure this first, then there is a sum stabilizer that ends commits with that measurement. And after those two measurements, there's some stabilizer still ends committing with, with that measurement. So a little bit of care is needed, but that's possible. And the end result is that, oh, and the re result is that I managed to transform the, the, the Tori code on the white lattice into the Tori code on the red lattice, tensored with some completely disentangled qubits. And that transformation was in, enacted by some unitary acting on this region only. So, said yet differently, I managed to transform a Tori code on the white lattice into the one coarser red lattice using a 
some small depth quantum circuit whose gates are uh, geometrically local. So if I do it you know, indefinitely, the, en the end result is that I'm left with a Tori code on, say, four qubits. And then you can do the calculation. Can you explain what the unit tree does? I understand the measurements and how they change the system, but yeah. I don't so measurement was a conceptual vehicle that, you, that, that allows you to think about the transformation more visually e evident. Unitary is the backup argument that my transformation, my post-measurement state is a unitary result of my previous one. So only, I, I only need the existence of such a unitary. This is a one concrete uh, realization. Yes. Yes. Yeah, there, there's a, 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 some care is needed. The measurement outcome must be post-selected here for this particular unitary. Uh, that makes the, uh, yeah, but, but this is just, just a, the existence of unitary is just a tool. Um, sort of like a unitary that disentangles both qubits. Right, right. Well, I could have equally said that, oh, oh, let me show you that there exists a unitary circuit that disentangles the Tory code on the white lattice into, into the, the red lattice. I could do that, and you can actually calculate what it is, but how would you find that? I find that somewhat cumbersome, so I introduced another trick to think about this problem, where you just think about the measurement and uh, try to disentangle a bunch, and you realize that, oh, my measurement, I, I, yeah, I thought about measurement, but all I did was already achievable by unitary. Ah, that's non-trivial. Uh, that some care is needed, actually. Uh, as you measure, well, yeah. Making one measurement, you could choose a one anti-commuting stabilizer that is nearby. It might grow, yes. So, you, th right, that, that, that's the non-trivial part. The trick is that you do it on a patch here and a very far distant patch there. And the, any manipulation, any growth of any oil, any violation of locality uh, uh, violation will be, will be happening in this Gauss elimination procedure. So that's, uh, that's the step where a little bit of care is needed, but that's possible, which I not, have not explained. Yep. Yes. No. Right. Measurement was acting on the one qubit, but the overall effect was as if you had applied unitary on two qubits. So you think it will not grow up frequency? It may grow up, so you need to be careful. But in this particular instance, it's possible that you maintain the locality. What, what, what? Why, uh, why do I want that? This leaves on a smaller number of qubits. So if I could iterate this process inductively, then I can say that, oh, here's my infinite family of Tori codes, but the ca calculation of number of encoded qubits for entire family reduces to my finite calculation. And I'm, I'm showing you the, how the, redu the, the reduction is done. Okay, now, now let me conclude um, how it, it shows the, the, the homology is topologically invariant. The suggestive uh, 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 picture is that um, given the topological space, you, make a, you, you consider two different elevations. Uh, say you have a two identical torus, here I have triangulated in, a, in, a, in some fashion. Here I triangulate in, in a different way. And I want to show that the homology calculation from those two cellulations result in the same group. How can I do that? The usual argument is that you think about the, the refinements of this such that the refinements would agree. And at the same time, you show that as you refine, the homology doesn't change. I did the inverse thing. I did the starting with the very fine-grained lattice, and I went to the coarser. 
but it's a unitary transformation. So homology, in particular, the code space dimension should not change. So I have exactly implemented this argument. All right, um, so uh, bootstrapping this transformation, you end up in a two logical qubits. The answer is, yeah, <laughs> this is a uh, two-dimensional subspace. You end up in a two uh, uh, logical qubits. If you, since this is a unitary transformation, you can think about this as, as an encoding, encoding map. Starting with a two logical qubit, you build up your code space and you become a, a large Tori code state, very highly entangled, complicated state. And you can think about that. Um, and if you think a little bit more, then you can show that the entire process has a linear depth in the linear dimension of the torus. No, <laughs> no, uh, the, the, I'm, I'm, I'm completely ignoring the fault tolerance stuff here. Um, uh, this transformation will actually uh, amplify your errors. So <laughs> in practice, don't do it. Uh, yeah, so yeah, the, right, so you, right to, from the two logical, pure, you know, not naive logical qubits, now inversing this procedure, you end up in a big torus which means, inter interpret differently, you have just wrote down an explicit quantum circuit that generates the Tori code state out of a par product state. And that, the, the, the depth is growing with the, with, the, with, the, with the system size. And then next, well, day after tomorrow, we're gonna show that that's actually the best you can do. So it's some, some complexity argument. Sorry? Maps of the chain complex of the coding theory uh, interpretation. Um, it's just that definition of a code. One, one uh, crucial difference when you encounter a chain complex in a topological context or any other, um, if you are purely interested in a topological data of under, underlying space, then you know, having a map and uh, having the dimension often suffices. But when it comes to the coding theory, you need to count the weight of each row and column. Yeah, so what I meant was, uh, like, if you have, uh, like, two chain complexes, right, and you're maybe going to do the code, you can get out a map of the chain complexes. Ah, 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 ah. Excellent question. Um, there may be. I don't know. I don't know a good one. Thanks. Thank you.